Hello, everyone. Welcome to the intro to a better tech economy webinar. We're going to get started in just a couple of minutes as we wait for late arrivals and wait for the room to fill in. So feel free to grab, you know, your lunch, a glass of water. Uh, we will get started in just a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll keep repeating this message uh, one or two more times uh, as uh, new people are entering the room. Welcome to those of you just joining us. We're going to get started in a couple of minutes. We're just waiting for the room to fill in. I'll keep repeating the message about one or two more times, and then we'll get started. Welcome to those of you just joining us. We're gonna give it about one more minute before we get started. Well, I think everyone's in, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining the Intro to a Better Tech Economy webinar. I hope you all can hear and see me. My name is Herman Calderon. I'm the community manager at Tech Equity Collaborative. And so in my role, I get to engage with our supporters through our organizing efforts. And now I get to engage with you all here. So feel free to drop in any questions into the Q&A box as we go throughout the presentation. Um, we'll answer any questions that you all have at the end. And I do want to say that the webinar is being recorded and will be sent out afterwards via email along with uh, relevant links that we talk about today. So if you want to share that with somebody or maybe you miss something and want to go back, uh, you'll be able to access that. What are we covering today? Well, we're going to talk about the community uh, tensions with tech. We'll talk about bad policy choices that have predated tech's arrival, how Tech Equity Collaborative fits in to combat some of these issues. And uh, we'll talk about some solutions we've identified that can help support to ensure that our tech economy is working for everyone. So let's talk about these tensions with tech. Uh, I know communities are frustrated with tech and it really comes to no surprise. You know, we've seen that when tech shoulders the blame, it starts to create this us versus them dynamic that's further dividing our communities. And I know for myself, I've personally grown up in the Bay Area my whole life and I've kind of been able to witness this firsthand. I have friends and family who are worried about the changes they're seeing in their communities, what that means for their homes, what that means for their jobs. But also have friends and family who ended up pursuing jobs within tech and you know have found lots of success. And unfortunately, as the tech sector continues to expand, especially accelerated by remote work into other cities across the country, you know, we're seeing that many of these inequities experienced in the Bay Area are beginning to replicate elsewhere. But how did we get here? Well, we know that tech didn't start this level of pain our communities have been facing for years. You know, inequities have been in our economy and our society for decades, even when Silicon Valley was still just farmland. And all of these feelings of frustration are understandable, like we just talked about. There's no doubt that tech has exacerbated inequality, but tech didn't necessarily start some of the issues. And over the last couple of decades, there's been this overall shift in the balance of power that has hindered our community's ability to prosper and to survive. So let's talk about what we've seen historically. That shift of power really has benefited corporations. While the government was cutting back on social programs, they were simultaneously cutting taxes for large corporations in the 80s. And individual tax rates have been Following the same trajectory throughout the years, that's the blue line on the top of the chart, but we see that corporate taxes have been on a steady decline, and that's the gold line at the bottom. And just to put that in perspective, in 2019, 49% of our tax revenue, around $626 billion, was collected from individuals versus only 5%, $59 billion coming from corporations. And these tax cuts and increase in profits for companies has come at the expense of workers and worker voice. We know that corporations have a long history of suppressing worker power and voice, and 
There are numerous accounts of union busting and strategic attacks on worker-centered organizations that have only reinforced this profit over people approach. And a combination of all this has led to the shift in power that is still disproportionately impacting people in our economy today. I mean, corporations have begun to flex this shift in power by entering communities and buying up apartments and homes in an effort to maximize profits. And we're seeing corporations' bad practices as new landlords through inaccurate background checks, predatory ownership schemes, and exclusionary lending. And they've begun to reinforce some of the racist and exclusionary housing practices of the past, also known as redlining. Now, what is redlining? Well, in the 1930s, the federal government instituted a policy that still failed today, especially within communities of color in the Bay Area, in California, and all across the country. And that policy is redlining. And redlining was a process in which the Homeowners Loan Corporation, a federal agency, gave neighborhoods ratings to guide investment. And the policy is named for the red or hazardous neighborhoods that were deemed riskiest. So on maps, those uh, neighborhoods were literally redlined, as we can see with the image of, on the screen, um, a map of Seattle on the left side. All those red blocks are examples of redlined neighborhoods. And those communities that were deemed risky for investment or redlined didn't receive any investment at all. And these neighborhoods were predominantly home to communities of color, and that really is by no accident. The hazardous ratings were in large part based on racial demographics. In other words, redlining was a discriminatory policy and a racist policy, and it made it hard for residents to get loans for home ownership or for maintenance of their homes for something like building a new roof. And consequently, redlining led to cycles of disinvestment, including development and production within these neighborhoods. And there's a terrible history of underinvestment, underbuilding, and exclusion in our country. And often those communities that have been historically underinvested in and have been redlined are the very same communities that are at risk of gentrification today. And on top of exclusionary zoning policies, it's simply just too expensive to build affordable homes in our country today. If we take a look at San Francisco, for example, it costs about $1.2 million to build one unit of housing. And even if more housing does get built, tenants aren't being protected enough to be able to remain in their homes. You know, we've seen that eviction rates and displace displacement rates have continued to uh, increase heavily over the years. And families have been pushed into the outer edges of major cities, further away from job centers and resources. And just in New York, you know, weakened tenant laws have drastically led to a decrease in homes of, that are available for people. And evictions aren't just happening in expensive areas like San Francisco and New York, but also in up and coming tech cities like Atlanta. And eviction rates across the country are continuing to push out our most vulnerable community members away. And on top of tenants having little to no power in order to combat these evictions, they're also lacking that power in their jobs. And as we can see here, the hourly pay for workers hasn't increased much the last couple of decades, even though productivity has dramatically increased. And according to the Economic Policy Institute, the share of workers that's covered by a collective bargaining agreement or unions dropped from 27% to 11.6% between 1979 and 2019, meaning that the union coverage rate is now less than half where it was 40 years ago. And this means that employees you know, have less bargaining power, to advocate for better pay rates in alignment with the work that they're delivering. And not having this ability to speak up and address worker injustices has led to this constant disturbing stories about worker conditions that we're hearing um, every day in the news. You know, We're hearing that uh, disturbing workplace practices are putting workers uh, at risk both physically and mentally. And a lot of the times the workers that are the most impacted are contract workers uh, or people performing what's known as ghost work. Ghost work is a term that's used to describe the kind of work that feels like it's automated, but in reality, it has a person behind the scenes performing these tasks. So uh, content moderation is, is a quick example about, of people behind the scenes doing that kind of work. And in our research on contract workers in tech, we found that contract workers receive fewer benefits 
and less pay than tech employees while doing the same work as their directly employed counterparts. And these workers are disproportionately Black, Indigenous, Latino, Asian, women, and non-binary people. And it's a little out of context that the tech industry came to power and cemented itself as the engine of our current economy. The tech industry's position as arguably the most powerful sector of American business requires that they do take some responsibility for how the economy has grown and is growing. And in addition, tech should employ some business practices or create products that are directly impacting the economic health of our communities. And if we look at the top companies in our economy today, there's a few familiar faces on there. Um, and tech does own a lot of the market share. So we have Apple, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, just some of the top ones. And like we talked about, tech didn't necessarily create social and economic inequity in the US, but it has had a role in worsening some of those inequities and it does have a responsibility to help fix it. At Tech Equity Collaborative, our community of tech workers, activists, community members, and advocates have the civic power to help rebalance this shift in power within and outside the tech industry. And we identify and uncover often overlooked issues of inequity so that you can be a champion for some of their solutions. So how does Tech Equity Collaborative work? Well, our goal is to change the conditions in which the tech sector is growing. And we believe that effective structural change will eliminate a culture and policies that have institutionalized inequity leading to stronger and more resilient communities. And we help our community approach these big problems and engage in system change in three major ways. So our programs educate you about the most critical civic issues where you live. And we do this in a variety of ways. We host book club discussions, panel discussions, webinars. We produce voter guides around election season. And we also advocate for public policy that rebalances power and builds economic equity. And a perfect example of that is our work on the Tenant Protection Act of 2019, which extends protections to over 8 million California renters and prevents unjust evictions and price gouging of rents. We also had the Pay Transparency for Pay Equity Act last year, SB 1162, increasing pay transparency and requiring more equitable hiring practices. And finally, there's corporate practice, aiming to turn companies into agents of equity in the broader community through our corporate partnership uh, and engagements. So what are issues that we're seeing within tech and as a result of tech that we can help address? Well, within the tech sector, we're seeing that there's large disparities emerging between headquarters, warehouse, and contract workers temporary and contract and contingent workers who are hired through these contracting agencies are often doing the same work as their directly employed peers while making less money, receiving fewer benefits and experiencing career immobility. And at Tech Equity, we've done research known as the Contract Worker Disparity Project to help uncover some of these issues. And at the same time, the tech industry has an imperative to make its employee base more representative of the population at large, not just to create broader economic opportunity, but because companies with uh, diverse representation at all levels are more likely to be successful than those that aren't. And as I mentioned, we worked on the Pay Transparency for Pay Equity Act, SB 1162, to help address some of these inequities within the industry. And there's also inequities as a result of tech that we've been working on you know, tech has produced a lot of wealth and that wealth has exacerbated some of our communities. You know, people have been displaced, uh, homes are becoming more expensive. However, we can repurpose some of this wealth to strengthen tenant protections, produce more affordable housing and help communities organize around policies that change the ownership structure back into the hands of the people instead of corporations. And we've tackled these issues through our work on Prop 13 reform. And next up, we have the impact of tech products. You know, prop tech is accelerating the corporate takeover of single family starter homes and renting at a mass scale. And these new companies are venture backed, digitally enabled, and they play an increasingly influential role in the economy from new modes of housing construction to automated home buying. Some of these tech enabled companies are promising to scale to massive market share and reap higher valuations along the way. So we have to be thoughtful about 
how we can work with companies to not reinforce some of the biases in their products. And we're working on this already through our tech bias and housing initiative. And we're also building tools, visualizations, and apps that are supporting the movement for economic justice. And you can actually join our team of volunteer researchers, designers, coders, and data analysts to collaborate on some of these tough problems and share new skills. For example, we've had volunteers in the past help us to build out a website that renters can use to find out if their landlord's rent increase was legal or illegal and how to get access to resources. And that's tenantprotections.org. You can go on there uh, if you're a renter and, and find out. Uh, this year, you know, our key initiatives uh, really began with the Contract Worker Disparity Project. As I mentioned, it's a first of its kind worker-centered initiative that sheds the light of practice, the light on the practice of contracting out and proposes and advocates for public policy solutions and partners with companies to adopt some of these responsible contracting practices. Next, we have the Tech Bias and Housing Initiative, examining the promise and perils of housing technology. And we're aiming to ensure that the technological innovations in the housing space do not reinforce the racist housing systems and policies of the past. And finally, we have uh, the Housing Data Initiative around passing good policy. And you know, passing good policy is meaningless if those policies aren't implemented well. So together with our coalition partners and government officials, you know, we're identifying where tech can be a lever for smart policy implementation. And we enlist tech workers to build some of the tools that can help us move us from talk to action. So what can you do today? Well, you can sign up to become a civic tech volunteer. You wanna flex your skills. You can tell a friend about us and the, the kind of work that we're doing. You can contribute to the organization financially if you're able to do so. Um, or you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one conversation I do offer just a, a separate meeting on a more individual level um, for us to talk about, you know, different ways to get involved, what we offer as an organization, um, and how to get plugged in into any of that if you're interested. Um, you can also check us out at our next event. We have an event coming up in November, um, a book talk uh, called Recoding America, which I can link to in the follow-up email. So I'm sure that was quite a bit of information. I'm going to take like a minute to see if anyone has any questions. Um, it's okay if you don't, you can also follow up with me via email um, and uh, ask any questions that way as well. So I'll just take a couple of seconds, see if anything pops up. Cool, not seeing anything totally fine. So just wanna thank everyone for your time. We hope you feel inspired to join our movement. Like I said, keep an eye out on that email. Um, if you have questions, follow up with me on there. If you're interested in a one-on-one, -on -one, follow up with me on there. Um, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much.